Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Empirical Data on the Path to Genomic Medicine. I am Judy O'Rourke of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Robert C. Green, MD, MPH. Dr. Green is a medical geneticist and physician scientist who directs the Genomes to People Research Program in Translational Genomics and Health Outcomes in the Division of Genetics at Brigham and Women's Hospital, the Broad Institute, and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Green sees patients and conducts empirical research around the medical, behavioral, and economic outcomes associated with the implementation of genomic medicine. He currently co-chairs the steering committees of both the Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research Program with 18 NIH grants and over 300 investigators, and the Newborn Sequencing in Genomic Medicine Program with four NIH grants and over 100 investigators, and is a co-investigator in the recently awarded Partners Project as a member of the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Network. Dr. Green is Associate Director for Research of Partners Healthcare Personalized Medicine and a member of the Executive Committee for the Partners Biobank. I will now turn it over to Dr. Green for his presentation. Thanks very much, Judy. It's a pleasure to be here talking to all you folks who are watching this on your computers. I'm going to give you an overview today of the kind of research that I do, and uh, I'm really excited to talk to you about this research. Uh, I'm going to show you some data that we've collected in the past and whet, whet your appetite for some of the data that's coming out of the MedSeq project and the BabySeq project, which are taking place right now. Now, you know, um, we do sort of rely on our uh, academicians to try to give fair and balanced attention to data. So it's important that you know my disclosures, and here they are. Uh, and uh, I'll be uh, talking about uh, some of the things that industry is very interested in, in terms of personalized medicine and personalized and precision genomics. So the starting point for where my work begins is with the patient. And there's all this extraordinary uh, biological research going on, all this extraordinary computational research going on in genomics. But there is also the last mile problem. In other words, what are we going to do when we get information that we learn from genomics research and how are we going to use it with patients? When is it going to be ready for prime time? And how are we going to decide what are the impacts for doing this? And the project, the program that I run is really a program in looking at uh, uh, the medical, behavioral, and economic outcomes of this. Now, when we talk about genomics and genomic testing, we're really talking about multiple things. We're talking about enhanced newborn screening, the idea that at the beginning of their life, uh, a, a newborn baby could have uh, their entire genome sequenced, and this could serve as a blueprint for them for the rest of their life. We're talking about the diagnosis of rare condition, which of course is already underway using exome and genome sequencing. We're talking about preconception screening. Is it really something we're going to leave to random chance if you have a recessive carrier trait and you're uh, having a baby with somebody else and you're going to leave it to chance whether to know if they're carrying a recessive carrier trait as well in an era where we can actually detect that. We're talking about prenatal screening and diagnosis. And of course, NIPT has had an extraordinary um, a rise in popularity lately. We're talking about something medical genetics has always done, which is the pre-symptomatic testing of families with uh, genetic diagnoses like Huntington disease or BRCA or cardiomyopathy. We've got a new era coming. Many people are interested in the notion of predispositional screening using genome sequencing. That's going to be a hot and controversial area uh, because uh, it really depends on whether you are interested in the narrative of prevention alone or whether you really are demanding 
uh, evidence to back that up. Of course, there's an entire enormous area for targeted therapies with cancer and pharmacogenomics that I'm really going to speak very little about today. And then there is uh, uh, the uh, thing we often forget about when we're talking about personal genomics, which is the degree to which all of this research uncovers um, pathophysiology of disease in ways that can give us clues to new treatments and, and new strategies for treatment. So I think we're, um, you know, we're, we've got a lot of opportunities to think about these things, and we're only going to cover a few of them today, and these are the few that I've been most interested in over the past 15 years in thinking about how genomics is going to impact the medical, behavioral, and economic aspects of patient care. So I started um, in the area of Alzheimer's disease, and I was very interested in whether a risk variant for Alzheimer's disease was an appropriate thing to share with family members who were asking about it. You know, all my genetics colleagues at that time said, oh, no, 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 you can't possibly be wanting to disclose that. And actually, it's still controversial to this day, even though we've now done a lot of research in this. And the research that we did in this area is called the REVEAL study risk evaluation and education for Alzheimer's disease. We've actually had this funded for many years, many iterations, and it arises out of the APOE variant, a very common variation, uh, where about 20% of the population has one copy of this allele, putting them at about three times the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And another couple of percentiles have two copies of the 4-4, which put them at about 15 or 30 times the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Now, when we first started this, there were families asking, hey, can I, can I learn this about myself? I'd, I'd like to know. And there was a lot of pushback because this was not then, and it still is not an actionable condition. There's no prevention, there's no proven treatment to keep you from getting Alzheimer's disease if you discover that, that, that you have this variant. But yet people still wanted to know. So I'm not going to take you through all the work we did over, over the past 15 years, um, but we've published over 34 manuscripts with the data from the REVEAL study. I will mention our sort of flagship paper in which we reported the results of a randomized clinical trial in which we randomized people to get their APOE genotype or not to get their APOE genotype. And then we compared how they did on all sorts of outcomes of understanding, emotional impact, anxiety, distress, and so forth. And the long and the short of it is, well, we were able to see a signal of sorts. It certainly made a difference whether you found out you were E4 positive or E4 negative. We were unable to demonstrate a group change in anxiety or distress that was really clinically significant. In other words, People did surprisingly well with this information. Now remember, these are people who elected to get this information. <clears throat> so it's not like we were forcing this on them. So that was quite an interesting observation, and we've been able to replicate that in several additional trials. In addition, we were among the first to show that people were trying to do things with this information. So they were trying to do more exercise, do more medications, uh, the vitamin, things they thought would help them, even though there was no proven treatment for Alzheimer's disease. And we also showed that people were more likely to report that they were going to purchase long-term care health insurance. Now, this has been talked about for a long time, the notion that learning you're at risk for something would put you at increased risk for, um, or put, would, would predispose you to buy more insurance if you found you were at increased risk or less insurance if you found you were at less risk. The insurance companies call this adverse selection, and they're quite rightfully concerned about it because if clients know something the insurance company doesn't know, then uh, they can buy a lot of insurance and essentially put the insurance company out of business. Now, we'll get back to this when we talk a little later about Gina, but what this suggests is that there is a real potential for adverse selection in a world where lots of people are learning about their genetic risk. Now, uh, with um, a lot of investigators, but particularly with Kirk Christensen shown here, we've uh, published quite a lot uh, around the REVEAL study. 
Here's a few of the headlines from our different papers. In case you're interested, all of these uh, can be found on our website. And we are um, continuing to publish. I have one slide to show you some, some of the data from our most recent publication, where we use the clinical trial methodology to add a single additional piece of information to the risk information about Alzheimer's disease. So what we did is one arm got just the risk of favorite Alzheimer's disease based on their APOE. The other arm got some risks about their heart disease potential, also based on APOE, because there's a pleiotropic effect there. We found some fascinating uh, results. It turned out that getting one additional piece of information made you less anxious and more likely to act on the results in terms of some sort of lifestyle improvement, exercise, diet, so forth. So you got the same information about your risk of, of Alzheimer's disease, but adding an additional piece of information about heart disease, even if it meant you were to increase risk for heart disease, reduced your anxiety and distress from the first piece of information. Really strange, there's something about piling on the information maybe that, that seems to reduce the valence of any particular piece of it. It's really hard to interpret and but maybe this is a clue to why several hundreds of thousands, a million people have gotten risk information with direct consumer genetic testing for scores of disease risks and really haven't had much, um, much distress about it been fascinating to watch the rollout of direct consumer genetic testing. Well, speaking of that, we saw this phenomenon coming. It got launched, as you know, in 2007 and gradually built up steam with the first couple of companies out there. And we were very curious to take what we had learned in the reveal study and study sort of the multiple risk factors that were being disclosed by the companies that were uh, promoting direct consumer genetic testing. So. We got funded by NIH to do this and in 2010 launched a very carefully crafted survey uh, with two companies, as you can see here. And we were able to uh, examine people's opinions and attitudes before they got themselves uh, tested, shortly after they got their results, and six months later. And again, we've uh, got quite a few papers coming out about this. Uh, it stirred a lot of controversy, as you know. The FDA ordered um, 23andMe, the leading company at that time, to uh, cease operations in 2013. Uh, we were among the, the few people who wrote that uh, maybe this was overly cautious because there had already been 700,000 um, individuals who'd received these results. There had already been quite a few research studies of the customers and we really hadn't seen evidence of harm, uh, the FDA has since re-allowed uh, that particular company to start selling recessive carrier traits again, and they're working on trying to get regulatory approval for their entire portfolio. Um, but we started studying this, and again, uh, I'll just flash some titles up because we've, we've published quite a lot about this. We've looked at how confident people are about their knowledge, um, I'll show you some data about what they do with the results. And um, uh, interesting that when people are adopted, how they perceive their direct consumer results, because of course they don't have family histories, and uh, how they interact with their primary care doctors. And just to zoom in on a little bit of this, let's ask some questions that are commonly asked about personal genomic testing, particularly direct to consumer testing. So what is it that they're most interested in? And our research suggested, no surprise here, they're very curious. They're interested in their health, they're interested in their ancestry. And uh, one thing we documented that really hadn't been talked about much, it's kind of obvious when you think about it, they're, they're interested in if there are explanations for something they already have. So for instance, you've got diabetes, you go first and look at the diabetes. Here's a little uh, paper on this and some of the data we saw. So if you already had a diagnosis you can see on the right of heart disease, you were more interested in the heart disease genetics than if you didn't already have a diagnosis. Same thing on the far left, you can see if you already had ulcerative colitis, you were much more interested 
in the genetics of alternative, col alternative colitis, then you were you didn't already have it. Now, at one level, this makes perfect sense. Look, we're interested in ourselves, and if we have something, we kind of go and we're pulled to that. But at another level, in a product that's being pitched as a predictive risk product, this is sort of profoundly irrational, right? Because, um, you know, if you already have it, why would you go looking at your genetic risk variance for uh, whether or not you're going to get it? So that, that was pretty interesting. And, you know, there's been a lot of controversy around the DTC arena about whether the algorithms for risk estimation are correctly calculated. Are they appropriate? And our answer to that is both yes and no. We took a hard look at these um, algorithms, the senior author, Cecil Janssen's, and uh, we came up with the same observation that others have made, that in fact, the three original companies who got into the direct-to-consumer market actually computed their summary algorithms in different ways. And some of those ways we didn't think were completely accurate. But we uh, also came up with pretty obvious explanations for why they did so. And one of the most obvious explanations was that one company would take 10 different markers to make their calculation, another would only take six, or another would take 14. So, you know, some of this is pretty easily remedied if the companies agreed on how many markers they were going to use to make their estimation. Turns out, though, that at first blush, if, if perfect concordance were along the uh, uh, diagonal lines there, you can see that the different companies were at quite uh, some discordance in terms of their uh, estimations for risk. Now, a very important question is whether uh, customers understand what it is that they've been told. And the answer to this is mostly yes. We were able to look in this paper uh, at uh, uh, questions. We actually created um, uh, models for, uh, or, or sort of dummy results, and asked the customers specific questions about interpreting them, so they weren't biased by their own results. And if 100 is a perfect score, you can see that on these some of these scenarios, people were scoring 66, 83, 59, 82, 93, uh, 98, 63, 74. They're not perfect, but they are consistently better than average. And for many of these answers, they're above 90%. So. Yes, these are early adopters. These are not necessarily the kinds of people who will be doing direct-to-consumer genetic testing in a world where millions of people are doing it every day. But uh, so far, pretty good comprehension. One of the big concerns was if you give people pharmacogenomic information, will they run off and change their own prescription medications based on this? And our answer is no. They don't seem to be doing that. Uh, our preliminary data on this, uh, under, currently under review, suggests that less than 1% of people who could have changed m medication will do so without medical consultation. So it just doesn't look like they're going to run out and, and do this on their own. And, you know, a, a really interesting sort of subtle question is, does this whole experience change their perception of their own risk? You know, if it doesn't even change their perception of their risk, then um, it's probably not going to have much impact on their behavior. So we were able to show that we think it does. So let's take the common complex variants for uh, cancer risk. These are not the Mendelian single gene cancer predisposition variants. These are more GWAS type uh, variants for uh, cancer that were provided in direct-to-consumer testing. And it turns out that, as you can see on the left, if you, even when you have a negative family history, if you learn that you're at elevated risk, then indeed it changes your perception. You see that triangle goes up higher than the square. Interestingly, if you've got a positive family history for cancer, the amount of increase in your perception of your own risk is even higher. So something about the personal template that you walk into this experience with pushes your risk perception higher. Same sort of thing over here on the right with lung cancer. 
except that here, if you've got a higher personal risk of lung cancer because you're a smoker, you will also boost the increase in your perception when you get an elevated risk message from the company. Well, there's been some very interesting arguments, uh, both here in the United States uh, in published essays, and also this is a common uh, refrain in Europe, that personalized genomics in general is a bad idea because it's going to stimulate all sorts of medical spending that's unnecessary. And our results suggest this isn't exactly the case so far. We found, oops, there we go. We found that the number one and really only significant variable that determines whether people take their results and go out and get a bunch of medical tests is whether they got a bunch of medical tests the year before they got their direct consumer testing. In other words, if you're a person who likes to get tested, this will be another opportunity for you to get tested. But it did not seem to be related to the number that you got back from the direct to consumer company. So it was almost impervious to the message you were getting. Now, I don't know if this is good news or bad news. I mean, it's good news in the sense it's not you know, costing the medical care system a lot of money. Uh, it may be bad news if you're trying to argue that the direct to consumer genetic testing has a real world impact on surveillance and, and prevention of disease. <laughs> and importantly, do these customers do anything with their results? Now, there's been this narrative uh, throughout personalized genomics, uh, partly in response to the dearth of data, of really good data in, in this arena. And, and fed by Cochrane reviews of, of the data that's out there, that when people get genetic risk information, particularly common complex risk information, they just don't do anything with it. It doesn't have any impact on their behavior. You know, that may be partly true, in part because behavior is really tough to change under any circumstances. But um, we do see that people are reporting some changes in their lifestyle with these results. In fact, about 30% of, of our, the customers that we surveyed reported that they improved their exercise or diet. Uh, now, we don't know if they actually did it or not, and we don't know the true cause and effect here. Maybe they got their genetic testing and it sort of stimulated them to make these lifestyle changes. Maybe they were making lifestyle changes anyway, and as part of that, Resolve, they went out and got direct consumer genetic testing. Uh, it's a little hard to untangle here. But it doesn't seem to suggest that people are doing less, which was one of the concerns, you know, the idea that people would find they would slightly lower genetic risk for diabetes, for example, and then they'd say, well, then I don't have to even worry about my diet. I'll go out and eat whatever I want. So that kind of false reassurance is a concern in direct consumer genetic testing and from the FDA. And uh, it's a little hard to untangle here, but our evidence does not suggest that um, this is a big concern. And, and finally, um, just out to try to address the question, is there any biological evidence of health benefit after any kind of common complex risk variants are used to stratify risk? And uh, yes, for the first time we have some data, although uh, this information was not presented as part of the direct consumer genetic testing company. It was common complex risk information for heart disease. It was presented as part of a trial at Mayo Clinic, senior author uh, Iftikhar Kulo, in which uh, this was demonstrated to, you can see the graph on the, on, the, on the bottom, the people who learned about their genetic risk of coronary heart disease as part of the medical process with their doctors, ended up with lower LDL cholesterol. Now, this was sort of a combination of perhaps the patient and the doctor working together. We don't know exactly whether it was a specifying more statin medication, or better compliance, or some combination of both. But uh, this was a carefully controlled study, and uh, it did for the first time demonstrate this kind of biological effect. So that's, that's pretty exciting. 
So finally, what happens when personal genomics consumers share their results with their primary care providers? Well, as you might imagine, all hell breaks loose. It's a pretty scary prospect because primary care docs are not well prepared for this information. A lot's been written about this. Uh, not quite that terrible. We published on this and it turns out that uh, a, a lot of people don't bother because uh, their results don't seem worthwhile to share or they just don't get around to it. Uh, and a, a large percentage, 35%, are extremely satisfied with their primary care docs. So some of them out there are doing something right when it comes to talking to their patients about this. But a pretty surprisingly high percentage, 18%, were very unsatisfied. And if you're interested, there, there's some great anecdotes in this article. Um, so you can go out and, and, and get it if you'd like. Uh, times when the primary care doc, you know, did dramatic things like taking the report and throwing it in the trash can. There's a huge spectrum of reactions to this from the primary care doc. So really interesting stories about how they respond to this. But you know, I wanted to show you some of those because we've, we've recently published a lot of those results, but I'm particularly excited right now to be uh, telling you a little bit about two trials which are ongoing and in which results are just starting to emerge. And um, these are trials that are uh, hoping to answer the question of how are we going to use exome and genome sequencing in everyday practice of medicine. Now, let me um, reiterate that we're already using exome and genome sequencing for the diagnosis of rare diseases. Uh, I, most of you have heard these incredible stories, uh, pretty unusual, but uh, children like uh, Nick Volker here who had a terribly uh, debilitating near fatal disease and were diagnosed and even treated uh, on the basis of genome sequencing. That's still the rarity. But we are seeing that when you get mysterious diseases that cannot be diagnosed by any other means, you can find a molecular diagnosis in somewhere between about 20 and 50% of these, depending on the presentation, the ascertainment, and so forth. That's pretty incredible. You've got these diseases where there's been a diagnostic odyssey, particularly in children. The parents have taken them from one doctor to another, and uh, sometimes at great expense, great heartache, and you actually can make a molecular diagnosis, relieving the family of the burden of not knowing, sometimes providing the opportunity for reproductive planning. So this is pretty huge. Um, but as this has become more common, we've been facing the problem and the opportunity of incidental finding. And as many of you know, I got to help lead the uh, ACMG working group on incidental findings. Now uh, in 2002, 13, we published this. And we uh, recommended uh, 24 conditions, 56 genes, be looked for and reported whenever you're doing clinical sequencing. <clears throat> and for the most part, this has permeated clinical practice pretty well. Uh, it's not a requirement. Patients can opt out of the entire group, but almost all patients, well over 90%, have opted in to receive these. And of course, many sites like Baylor are, are not only returning this minimum list of secondary findings, but also returning a much richer list of, uh, of uh, other uh, findings. There was a fair amount of debate about this. There's some debate that's continuing. And, and a lot of questions about what's the right analogy here. You know, if you get a chest x-ray for something uh, that's looking at your ribs and they see a, a shadow in your lungs, they're clearly going to report that. They're not going to ask you if you want it. They're not going to um, warn you ahead of time they might find something that's uh, secondary. But uh, on the other hand, people have pointed out, and I think they have a legitimate point, that we went through a period where we were shoving people into whole body scanners. And we were finding all sorts of stuff, and sending us on wild goose chases, sometimes getting biopsies, even surgeries that didn't need to be done, and that sometimes put people in harm's way. So, you know, we don't do that so much anymore. We don't we don't recommend or conduct whole body scans on healthy people, just looking for whatever we can find. So, I think this is still going to be played out because uh, in clinical sequencing, there's a lot more you can look for but at least there is a short list of um, mostly dominant conditions 
that uh, we think are medically important because you can do something about them. And this formed the basis for a dialogue uh, about incidental findings. The next part I want to talk to you about is the, <coughs> excuse me, is the MedSeq project. And the MedSeq project uh, arises out of the notion that sequencing is going to become so ubiquitous that all of us who practice medicine are going to need to use it, including people who aren't, don't have very much training in genetics. And that there's so much information, how do we create a process that can present this information to a practicing doctor in a way that doesn't require them to be a super specialist? And we designed it, this is kind of both a, um, a proof of concept study and a randomized clinical trial, or at least a pilot study of a randomized clinical trial. We took two groups of patients, patients who had a cardiomyopathy and patients who had basically generally good health. And we randomized each group to receive standard of care or an entire whole genome sequence with a full report. And then we just studied the heck out of it. All sorts of outcomes, medical outcomes, perceptual outcomes, behavioral outcomes, economic outcomes, and even outcomes, even the doctors were enrolled, and we studied the doctor's reaction to these as well. So our results are gonna, starting to come out on this. I, I don't have a whole lot to show you, but I will show you some interesting preliminary things. We wrote this little article uh, last year about GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act because so many of the patients we were approaching were still terrified about genetic discrimination. Now, you know, we have a very structured consent form and we told them <coughs> that uh, they were protected for certain categories from GINA, but when they learned that other categories such as disability, life insurance, and long-term care insurance were not protected by GINA, they were pretty hesitant about this. So um, we actually found that of the people who sat down with our genetic counselors to be consented, that's, that's already a big cut there, uh, about 28% of them declined and they reported that the insurance discrimination was the reason that they declined. So it's, you know, maybe that's, maybe Gina is one of the reasons we got anybody at all, but it's a little disappointing given that one of the stated goals of Gina was to reassure people so they could get genetic testing and they could participate in genetic research. I think that if we really are going to do genetic testing in, for example, the President's um, Precision Medicine Initiative, if we're really going to be creating all these data and giving them back to people and perhaps giving them back as well to their, uh, to their doctors and having them go into the medical records, we're going to need to address this even more robustly. Than Gina has done. The other thing that uh, we've worked on intensively in MedSeq, and this has been led by Heidi Rehm, who's one of our uh, co PIs in the MedSeq project and who runs the laboratory for molecular medicine, is the careful curation of variants. I won't go through this slide in detail except to say that, uh, as most of you know who are involved with variant curation, there is a portion of this that can be done in a scalable way with computer interpretation. And that involves the frequency filters, filtering against databases and so forth. But at the end of the pipeline, a lot of stuff comes out that's still wrong. And it requires someone with a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience to go and look up those papers and read those papers and review those papers. And it's also something that's gonna change every six to 12 months because so much new data is being added that um, the interpretation of genomes is not something that can be sort of fixed in stone and done once. So we're trying to address these questions in MedSeq by really making a lot of careful thought around the variant pipeline. And you can uh, read about this in the McLaughlin et al. article uh, from 2014 that we published on this. And also by building into the MedSeq protocol a re-evaluation and re-reporting component. We also did something I was quite proud of that a lot of commercial groups have adopted now, and that is we came up with a single page summary of the entire complexity of a whole genome. And uh, uh, you can see here that we've got uh, a 
portion at the top that talks about monogenic disease risk, a portion next to that that talks about carrier risk, a portion on pharmacogenomic variation, and in, in ours, a portion on blood groups that's been led by Bill Lane at our institution. <coughs> and uh, Jason Vassy pictured here has uh, published on this and other parts of the MedSeq project showing how this was designed, what our logic and rationale were, and how it's being used with primary care doctors in the MedSeq project. Well, here's some preliminary results. If you look now, not at just the 56 genes, but you look at 4,600 disease-associated genes, you find some pretty interesting things, even with just the first 100 people that we sequenced. So in the first 100 people we sequenced, 92 or 92% 92 of them are carrying at least one recessive carrier trait. Probably no surprise to you. We, know, we all know that we're kind of out there carrying an average of two or three or four of these. Um, but nice to see that validated nonetheless. But here was something pretty surprising. That 20% of this group of people were carrying a variant for a dominantly inherited or two recessive traits that uh, put them at risk for the appearance of a genetic phenotype. And this is not counting the people who were sequenced for cause for their cardiomyopathy. We're taking those out of the picture. These are unanticipated or secondary findings. And uh, we included in here some of the recessive, some of the uh, VUS's uh, leaning pathogenic. I'll show you in a minute some of the examples. But still, that's a pretty remarkably high percentage. <clears throat> now, it obviously doesn't mean that 20% are going to get these diseases, but what percentage either have some unrecognized form of this condition or are going to develop a condition in the future? And that's a question, of course, a critically important question and a question we just don't know the answer to. Here are some of the actual variants that we found in our participants. And you can see that uh, they're listed first with the pathogenic ones, then the likely pathogenic ones, and then variants of uncertain significance favoring pathogenic. So we're more sure about the ones at the top, less sure about the ones at the bottom. But nonetheless, you can see that they span a gamut of rare conditions. And um, we're currently in the process of going back to these patients and targeting our phenotyping to understand, did we miss something? Did their, all of their doctors miss something? Is there any subclinical version of this condition that they're walking around with? Or is it completely non-penetrant? So that's going to be really interesting. And I'll have some of those results to bring back to you on, on a future day. Well, of course, one of the huge questions that's being asked by scientists, by policymakers, by reimbursers, by companies seeking to invest in this space, is what's the clinical utility of sequencing healthy people? You know, is this going to be something that everyone should do? Is this going to be something that no one should do if they don't actually have a complaint? And we were able to explore that in the MedSeq project because we are actually sequencing healthy people and sending the results back to their doctors. And uh, what we're seeing is that primary care doctors do order things. They, they like to order things. They feel responsible to order things. And so you can see in this first case, a likely pathogenic variant was discovered for Romano Ward syndrome, a cardiac rhythm disorder. And the primary care doc um, gets an extra EKG and refers them to a cardiovascular geneticist. Perfectly reasonable. But yes, this is going to increase costs. Now, the question that's harder for us to answer in a small study that doesn't go for many years is how, um, how much value is any given patient going to get out of this kind of encounter? And uh, we're going to try to get some clues to that in the MedSeq project, but it's going to take larger numbers and longer follow-up to really answer this question. Uh, sort of um, cost effectiveness 101 here. Of course, what we're trying to sort out in this is whether there is enough benefit from early disease 
prevention and detection, that it balances out any harmful medical interventions that could accrue. Like the more tests you do, the more medications you start, the more potential for harm there is. Moreover, what's the cost of doing this? And through this, we can estimate cost effectiveness. And uh, Kurt Christensen and Jason Dassey in our group are working on models to actually estimate this for primary care. We've actually started publishing some of that. You can see in this preliminary data that doctors are taking more time and they are spending more money. And uh, for, for one of the first times ever, we're documenting what these costs will be in people who are healthy, but who go on to get sick. So, um, you know, if we really were Im imagining a thought experiment <clears throat> to answer this question of penetrance, we'd sort of say, well, let's sequence a whole bunch of people and then let's follow them for a long period of time and see what kind of conditions they develop. Now, that's a, that's a very expensive and very elaborate uh, study, but we do have some studies we can take advantage of. So uh, we turned to the uh, Framingham heart study where people, a subset of people have been sequenced and those subsets have been followed for an average of 20 years. We can kind of emulate that and ask, well, let's just take the ACMG 56. How many of those people, and it was 462 of them in Framingham, did we find a pathogenic variant in one of the ACMG 56 genes? Okay, 462 people, and we found 1% for five of them. Look on that top row, all ACM genes, you'll see that we observed five of them to have a pathogenic variant in an ACMG gene. Then when we looked at their clinical features over 20 years, we saw that four of those five, or 80%, had developed a clinical feature that was consistent with the genetic variant that had been discovered in them. So that's 80%. Well, the question really is, how does that compare to the rest of the population that's not carrying that mutation? And we estimated through modeling that it was dramatically different over 20 years, 80% versus 12%. Now, this is a pretty small sample size, so we replicated the entire exercise in the much larger, and now African-American, Jackson Heart Study. And we did this in over 3,000 people and found that 26 people were carrying pathogenic mutations. And of those, 27% had the clinical features suggestive of the condition. Well, we expected it to be fewer because this was basically a cross-sectional study. Uh, but still, our modeling found a statistically significant difference between those with the mutation and those without the mutation. So this is preliminary data. It's not yet published. Um, you can see the individuals at the bottom, all of whom contributed tremendous work to this. Um, and uh, it's under review, but in the public domain because it's been presented at national meetings. Um, we're very excited about these findings, and uh, hopefully we'll hear back soon. Of course, if you believe that screening is advantageous in adults, I know many of you do, probably many of you don't as well, then you probably, at least those who do, would say, well, why not start it at a younger age? I mean, even Francis Collins gets up and starts some of his talks by saying, imagine a day when every baby has their book of life uh, printed out the beginning of their life to be useful for their health as they go forward. <clears throat> and indeed, sequencing newborn babies is something that gets talked about a lot, but not done so much because there are a lot of, of troubling issues around this. Do you return a piece of information that suggests an adult onset condition? If you do, you're really taking away the choice of that baby once they reach the age of majority to choose that for themselves. Do you tell a parent something that is not completely penetrant about their baby, even if they say they want to know? I mean, look, your baby has a mutation for a childhood onset fatal cancer, but we don't know what the probability is that they will get that cancer. Now, if you tell somebody that message, is that really doing them any good? Or is that just injecting 
distress and concern into a parent-child relationship. Nonetheless, it's talked about so much and um, there are health systems and companies springing up to do this. It's really important to do it and study it in a very controlled manner with a lot of safety precautions. And that's what we've done in the BabySeq project. We've launched this project, again, very similar to MedSeq with two groups, a group of very sick NICU babies and a group of healthy newborns. The NICU babies aren't so controversial. There's a lot of people who are saying, you know what, sequencing NICU babies is getting more and more necessary because so many of them have something genetic going on. But it's still not standard of care, so fair game for trial. Sequencing healthy newborns is really um, novel and troubles a lot of people. We hope we're doing it in a very responsible, very thoughtful manner. Um, you know, people want this, or at least they say they want it. We did this preliminary study where we went on the, on the new baby ward, on the birthing ward, and we asked parents, hey, would you like to have your new baby sequenced? And a remarkable 18% uh, were extremely interested, 28% very interested, and another 36% somewhat interested. So if you believe those numbers, there's a big market for this out there. But it's all in the framing. And we tried to ask that question in a pretty neutral way. But when we started doing this, and we had a certain script that had been agreed upon with the IRB, where we may have had to emphasize more some of the downside of this, then we're finding that of the close to 500 first people who agreed to meet with the study group, agreed to hear about the study. This wasn't the people we walked in the room and they said, get out of here. This is the people who said, oh, sure, I'll meet with you. That sounds interesting. Only about 10%, 48 out of 495, actually enrolled. And most of the ones who declined were concerned somewhat about the burden of the study, but also very concerned about learning bad news or insurance discrimination for their baby as the baby grew up. So once again, we're finding that um, a couple of things, that the promise of genomic medicine is not necessarily as convincing to people when you present it in the context of some of the downsides. This is a very tricky area to be working in. We sometimes feel that, that we're sailing between the uh, scylla of the FDA and the Caribdis of the IRB. Uh, and uh, both of them, with the best of intentions, are uh, uh, struggling to make sense of this along with us. And uh, finally, I'll, I'll end up with uh, asking, what are people like you, those of you who are listening, I'm sure some of you are getting your own genome sequence. Some of you would like to get your genome sequence. And uh, we're very interested in what you're doing with your results. <clears throat> so we've launched something, a consortium we call the PeopleSeq Consortium. It's a bunch of groups that are out there doing their own thing, getting people sequenced and giving them the results. Basically healthy people. <laughs> this is George Church's PGP. It's uh, Lee Hood's Pioneer 100. Eric Schad's Mount Sinai Wellness Study, Thomas Kasky's uh, Genome Projects, uh, a new group from Nevada, a, now a group from Invite, uh, several other groups that are participating in this, and of course, the group that's done the most of this, the Illumina Understand Your Genome Program. So all these groups, in addition to MedSeq, are sequencing healthy individuals and giving them their results back. But none of them were systematically studying it. And what we've done is pulled all these groups together and we're systematically studying how people understand the results and what they're doing with them. So uh, I'll just give you one little teaser about the results that are coming out of this. In our first 60 or so people from UYG alone found out that the healthcare professionals who get their genome sequenced react a lot differently from the non-healthcare professionals. Turns out that the 72% uh, of the non-healthcare professionals um, had, had uh, discussed these results with their doctors. Doctors being doctors, a lot fewer of them said that they had done so. Uh, when it came to whether your genetic information should be part of your medical record, the non
on healthcare professionals were a lot more sanguine about that. And when it came to people having a right to access their own genetic information without going to a medical professional, the healthcare professionals were a lot more conservative about that. So lots of cool results that will be coming out of PeopleSeek in the months and years ahead. I want to acknowledge the kind of teams that it takes to run these very com big complicated studies, particularly the MedSeq project and the BabySeq project. Uh, there are an extraordinary number of really important people that are involved, uh, particularly our project leadership uh, there on the slide, and, and extending to our external advisory board, our consultants, and our safety monitoring group. And the very same thing is true of the BabySeq project. The BabySeq project is being run uh, co-led by Alan Beggs at Boston Children's Hospital and is uh, equally directed by scientists at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Boston Children's Hospital as the sick babies come from Boston Children's and the well babies are currently coming from Brigham and Women's. So we thank all those co-investigators and uh, really appreciate that uh, science like this is team science. And it has to be um, thought of and appreciated and credited as such. Um, I also want to thank all of you out there and your tax dollars for uh, NIH funding. And of course, to thank NIH, particularly NHGRI, that's funded uh, our CSER consortium, our MedSeq grant, co-funded the BabySeq project with the Child Institute, and many of the other grants that I've worked on both as a principal investigator and as a co-investigator with all of these talented friends and colleagues. So this is the core group, our Genomes to People research group. Uh, we're a really fun group here in Boston. If you're thinking of uh, pursuing a research career in this area, or you know someone who is, please uh, get in contact with us. We're very interested in students and trainees. We have slots for postdocs. We have slots for MD fellows. Um, and uh, we're very interested in uh, helping trainees progress in this area. Here's all the contact information for me and for our group. Uh, if you do Twitter, please follow us at both uh, Robert C. Green and Genomes to People. And uh, to sum up, we're uh, interested in uh, providing clinical sequencing for healthy individuals, and we're getting ready to launch this as a clinical product here at Brigham and Women's Hospital. We are continuing to hire genetic counselors and project managers with a strong background in genetics and genomics, and we are seeking scientific investment. And by this, we mean collaborators and trainees to support our coolest new ideas. Um, but of course, if you'd like to donate, we're up for that as well. I want to thank everybody for listening today and uh, really appreciate your time. Hope you enjoyed this and I hope you'll contact us with any questions. And I'm looking forward to any questions that might be raised uh, at this point in time. Thank you for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question is, what are the main questions that your research seeks to answer? Well, I think the overarching question is how do we use genomics in inside and outside of the practice of medicine? I believe that, I, I certainly don't believe that, that the practice of medicine is the only channel through which we're going to receive information about ourselves. I think it's pretty clear that there are going to be many channels, commercial channels, direct to consumer channels, hybrid channels where you you know, you purchase something from a company and you have a company doctor who's there providing minimal oversight. Channels where you can get it on your own, but there's somebody, there's sort of a safety net of someone to reach out of. And of course, conventional channels where you go to a doctor or a uh, other healthcare provider and, and, and a particular test is ordered and interpreted. So I kind of think of it like, um, you know, broadcast TV moving to cable TV with lots and lots more choices. Sort of think about that in the genomics world and really in the medical world at large. And I think that the research we do in Genomes to People is really asking, given that this area is exploding, given that there's so many ways for people to get information, potential ways for them to understand and misunderstand it, 
What's safe and what's not? What's beneficial and what's not? What's cost effective and what's not? And I think that that's, a, a, we're, we're, as I said at the beginning, we're right on the cutting edge of the last mile. Genomics is generating so much cool information, so much potentially life-saving information. Where can we apply it fastest, soonest, cheapest, safest uh, to, help, to help people? So those are the sort of questions that um, I think uh, we're focused on. What have we learned about how individuals react to learning about their genetic risks? Well, that's a huge and pregnant question. How people react to learning about their genetic risk has been something that geneticists and genetic counselors and ethicists and legal scholars have been very, very concerned about. And I don't blame them. I, as a geneticist, I sat across from someone who you're telling has just received um, a positive a message that they are going that, that, that they have a positive mutation for Huntington disease, and they're going to develop the disease if they live long enough. And this is a devastating, devastating piece of information. <clears throat> On the other hand, the number of conditions where you have a purely deterministic, untreatable devastating condition like Huntington disease are pretty few. What we really have discovered in genetics is an enormous panoply of risk variation and an enormous complexity of things which influence that risk and which interact with the environment. And in this context, I think we need to move away from being as concerned as we used to be about disclosing genetic risk information. Now, I'm not cavalier about this. I don't think that uh, we should ever press this on people who don't want it. I don't think that uh, we should be cavalier about some of the emotional uh, impacts that could accrue as people learn risks, particularly if they walk into the interaction with uh, a particular vulnerability. But I do think that the practice of medicine has for all time involved a, a certain amount of risk assessment and risk prediction. And if done correctly and thoughtfully and with appropriate education, genomics, I think, can be folded into that in a way that does not exceptionalize genomic information. I think the, the exceptionalization of so much genomic information has taken us partway down the wrong path. And I'm excited that, that you know, there are a lot of disruptive models out there for using genomic information that are, I think, normalizing this again, um, sometimes whether we like it or not in genetics. How are doctors responding to having genetic information available to their patients, or I should say on their patients? Well, primary care docs are completely unprepared for uh, the results of a whole genome sequence, and yet we got a dozen of them to volunteer to participate in the MedSeq project. And they got a few hours of training, not training in genomics so much, but training on how to read the report. See, our, our philosophy here is you don't have to be a nuclear physicist to read an MRI report. You don't have to be a chemist to read a chemistry lab report. You actually put the burden on the lab side to write a coherent report to make it clear what's going on and a little bit of training on the doctor side. And uh, we're finding that uh, these primary care docs are doing pretty well. Now, have they made a few mistakes? Sure. We're actually audio recording all their interactions as they disclose these results and they're not perfect. But uh, we're getting some real insights into the first wave of primary care doctors without a genetic counselor who are sitting there talking to their patients about their whole genome sequence. It's pretty exciting stuff to read the transcripts of these. Now, having said that, with these admittedly early adopters, I will say that our, our research paper on uh, primary care docs and direct consumer genetic testing made it clear that there's also a lot of reluctance, a lot of inertia, a lot of fear, 
and even a little bit of hostility out there among regular doctors to all this newfangled genomic stuff. So many primary care docs are very practical. This isn't going to give me something that I can specifically do for this patient in front of me. I don't even want to hear about it. On the other hand, others seem to take this as really interesting information, as a teachable moment to better counsel their patients, to talk to them about both genetic and environmental influences. So um, I think it's a little bit of a Rorschach on the doctor himself or herself as to how they respond to this. But big picture, there's no question that most people in American medicine are not yet prepared for this. I think they will need to be. I think it's going to be a massive training effort for all our specialty organizations to at least get us up to a certain level of competency in dealing with genomics. And you know what? If, if we don't do that, I think people are just going to find ways around the medical profession to get this information. And I think that would be really unfortunate. What are the most pressing issues facing the field of medical genetics these days? Well, remember that early slide that I gave that showed, you know, medical genetics is really seven or eight different things. It's really different when you're talking to a woman who has a high-risk pregnancy and an ultrasound abnormality about um, her situation versus a healthy individual who's getting a pathogenic variant in a cardiac rhythm uh, abnormality gene. So, you know, apples and oranges all across the board and lots of other food as well. Um, but I, I do think that the question of penetrance is probably the most pressing unknown that's preventing us from scientifically taking more advantage of the genome. Of course, penetrance means the probability that if you have the mutation, you either have or you're going to develop the disease in question. So for example, we know that BRCA1 is perhaps as high as 70% penetrant in women with a family history. We think that it's pretty highly penetrant, maybe 50-60% penetrant, even in women without a family history. But we're not sure. And we probably know the most about that one. So all these genes, including many of the ACMG56 genes that we recommended be disclosed, we did so with a certain amount of uncertainty about the penetrance, particularly in families that don't have a strong family history. That's a real limitation now on how to use this information, how to even talk about it. So I'd say penetrance is the number one problem for me in implementing genomic medicine. Okay, we have time for one last question. How do you predict genetic, genetic data will be used in the next 10 years? Well, many, many folks, including my friend George Church, has, has said that genomic technologies today are going to be like personal computer technologies in a few years, certainly within a decade. We're not even going to be able to imagine how we function minute to minute, day to day, without interacting with our genome, perhaps our, our expressome, our proteome, our metabolome, our biome. Uh, this, is, this sort of bio everything is going to be part and parcel of our daily life in the same way that electronic computers or smartphones are at this moment in time. I don't know if it's going to be that ubiquitous. But I do believe that within 10 years, it's going to be very much a part of everything we do in the practice of medicine and quite a bit more a part of the day-to-day -day life of all of us. So um, I feel really lucky to be in this area. It's kind of a growth area. I feel really fortunate to be at this fantastic institution of Brigham and Women's Hospital, Broad, and Harvard Medical School. and. Um, I feel really pleased to have the chance to speak to you today. Thanks again for watching, and I uh, look forward to speaking to you again in the future when I can bring you more data from MedSeq and BabySeq. Bye-bye.
I would like to once again thank Dr. Green for his presentation. Before you go, do you have any final comments to share with us today? Nope, I think we've, we've covered a lot of ground and I'm really delighted to have had the chance to speak with you. Thanks so much, Judith. Thank you again. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through November 11, 2016. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>